Hello and welcome to this presentation about Concord X by FlySim Labs, uh, which I've titled Simulation of the Highest Intensity. And the reason being that I really believe that no other aircraft can provide you um, a level of simulation so intense with so much activity, um, things to do, and that will push all your knowledge about simulation and aviation to the limits. And I think that Concorde is a unique aircraft uh, in the real world. And in the simulation world, the only faithful representation is the one made by FlySim Labs. And that's why I've chosen this particular model um, for this presentation. Uh, I will give you more details further on. Now, this presentation at first was not intended to be uh, published or post on, on the internet in English. But I prepared for for a um, live audience in the Ertsim meeting that will take place on March the 5th, 2016. So I'm publishing this presentation in English on the internet even before I made the, the real one over um, at the Ertsim meeting. The reason being that um, the presentation in Madrid will be aimed only at Spanish-speaking people and the audience will be somehow limited. And I thought that because the audience is completely different, internet, English-speaking people, uh, I could release this uh, earlier, uh, taking advance of the recent release of the version 1.3 uh, by FlySim Labs. Now, why should you waste your time watching this presentation? What can I offer you that can be of your interest? Uh, the first group of people that I would like to address is those that have been in the simulation world for some time, that uh, own several detailed aircraft, but for whatever the reason have never considered uh, or have never had the idea of flying Concorde. For example, uh, myself, uh, just four or five years ago, I knew that Concorde was a, super, a supersonic aircraft, but didn't have much interest until I saw one in Le Bourget Museum in, in Paris. After that, um, it was complete passion and love what I felt about this aircraft. So if that is your situation, you've never consider or, or think that Concorde could be interesting, I will show you why Concorde as an aircraft, not just the, the simulation model by, by FlySim Labs, but why Concorde as a particular air, aircraft is very different in many aspects from any other airplane you you can um, you may have flown in during your your simulation uh, time or experience many people would, would think that having concord maybe just one another bird with just one more plane in my hangar okay I, i've got uh single engine twin engines i've got propellers i've got jets uh okay and, and now i have concord i've got one more for the collection um i will try to show you why this is not the case and why uh, flying Concorde is really, uh, I mean that using the word unique is pretty, very common and for many things, but really there is nothing uh, that can fly the way Concorde flies. Now, the, the, finally, the last group of people I would like to, to address is those that, okay, could be interested in flying Concorde, they've heard about it, uh, they, are, they feel some curiosity and, and they would like to, to fly it, but mm, they are not as much interest as to finally make the purchase and invest uh, their money in, in something they are not very sure um, that will worth the money. So before we continue, I would like to talk a little bit about me so that you know what is my background and what can you expect from me. My name is Ramon Cutanda and sorry, I'm a Spaniard. So uh, Spanish is my mother tongue and you may have noticed already that my English is not as good as it should be, that my pronunciation, my speaking, uh, may I very likely will make some grammar mistakes and use the wrong vocabulary from time to time, or sometimes I won't find the, the right words to say, so I apologize about that in advance. Um, I really feel passionate about flying simulation. I've got all the passions in my life, but for sure simulation and flying in general is one of my main passions and that's what moves me to make this kind of videos and presentations. Uh, but in my real life I'm just a primary school teacher so my real job has absolutely nothing to do with aviation and therefore my knowledge of aviation is somehow limited and I'm not an oracle or someone that you should trust 100%. 
<clears throat> but even in this situation, I, I like to share what I know, even if it's not 100% accurate or perfect. Uh, every time I learn something that I feel is useful for me, I like to share it with other people. So I decided to create the website simulaciondevuelo.com, uh, a Spanish website. I, I have included a, a section for some English documents, such as this presentation and some of the Concord uh, documents that I will talk about later on. But, I mean, the main language will be Spanish. But as I said, I like to share what I know, even if I know that not all the time I'm 100% accurate. And that leads us to the next warning. I want to make it clear that I'm not a software developer, I'm not an airline professional, I'm not an aviation expert. So please take some caution in everything that I may say in this presentation. Now, I would like to, the first thing I would like to, to share with you why I feel so enthusiastic about Concorde, why um, uh, this is such a special experience to fly. The first thing is because it's unique. I said it before. It's been the only successful supersonic flight, uh, even if it was not as success, successful sorry, as it should be. I really believe that Concorde's um, and uh, it's quite un an unfair one. I, I really believe that Concorde should, ha ha should have had another opportunities, commercial opportunities, and I, I really think the, the, that shouldn't have ended the way it ended, but it was the most successful project, supersonic project uh, of ever, ever, ever in, in, in the human history. Now, the only close uh, competitor was the Tupolev uh, 144, which actually flew, uh, and in fact, it happened something very similar to the, the to the race that Russians had uh, against the American in the in the space in, in the space development. Uh, the, the Russians went first into the the space. The the first astronaut or cosmonaut went out, out into space. Uh, they did everything the first except the most important part, which was reaching to the moon. Something similar happened between Concord and, and the Tupolev. Um, the Tupolev um, t took off before Concord, um, reached uh, Mach 2 supersonic flight first, and then Mach 2 before the Concord did. But in the end, um, Concord was the, the the right bet. Now, on the other hand, the Americans, and particularly Boeing, and also Lockheed, but l the project of, of Lockheed, as far as I know, didn't get out of the paper. Boeing even built some models, uh, even though there was one in, in real size, that would show um, the the American project for supersonic service. Uh, it was much bigger, and it could get much, uh, many more passengers, but in the end, it was just a project and never saw light. So in the end, competition, none. Um, so the word unique, as I said, is justified in the sense that there is no other aircraft that can fly the way that Concorde flight or could flew the way Concorde flew. One example about the uniqueness of Concorde. Uh, this was a promotion flight um, the, taken by by Air France. So a Concorde departure from from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris with destination. Sorry, no, I'm saying it wrong. A Boeing 747 departure from Paris and with destination Boston Logan. At exactly the same time, a Concorde departure from Boston Logan with destination Charles de Gaulle in Paris. Now the Concorde. Uh, did the whole transatlantic, transatlantic, sorry, transatlantic flight, and landed in in Charles de Gaulle, and had a stopover of around 68 minutes, minutes I believe, and after refueling, refueling and setting everything uh, ready, departed once again with destination Boston Logan, and in the end, as you probably guess, Concorde arrived before. The Boeing 747 completed one transatlantic uh, flight. 11 minutes. Um, it, Concorde won the Boeing by 11 minutes. So that's just one example of, of the wonders that Concorde could achieve, crossing the whole Atlantic twice, even faster than than one of the biggest and best airlines of the of the time. The Boeing 747 did just one crossing. Um, so one of the things that I like very much about Concorde is that 
I consider it to be at the same time a classic. Obviously, it's classic. It's classic because of the time it was designed in in the end of the on the fifties and and the first test flies in the sixties. Uh, but uh, but also because if you have a look at the cockpit, you can see all the analog, analog gauges, analog switches, analog knobs. So it really feels like a classic air aircraft. But at the same time, Concorde included um, some of the nowadays common technologies, such as the fly-by-wire. Uh, was I can't remember if it was one of the f the very first or one of the first to use the INS navigation, which I, I will talk about in the next next slide so in the end you find that um as i said you have the feeling of a classic aircraft and at the same time you can do the the same routes that any other mother airline so it's it's like um half the way between two worlds now talking about the ins um it allowed concord and and other other also other competitors such as the the, the boeing 747s to use coordinates, uh, geographical coordinates. So up to that time, the only way of navigation was the classical radio aids navigation, but Concorde for the, was, as I said, one of the first uh, airplanes that was able to fly through coordinates and not depending on any external radio navigation aid, but um, once you program the, the the coordinations the coordinates uh, at departure then the, the aircraft is self-aware or of, of where of where concord is every in every single step and part and phase of, of the flight it has some limitations like only nine waypoints and you had to update it in order to not to lose accuracy along the route but uh, on the whole and with its limitations as i said um, it allows for uh, and modern uh, and actual and current navigation. Of course, you would also use, and, and as in with any modern other aircraft, there are some situations where radio navigation is, is more appropriate or more useful or, or the way to go. Um, combining these two um, types of navigation uh, makes Concorde really, really special. Another thing that I love about Concorde is uh, on the one hand is one difficulty or limitations, but at the other time it makes um, makes me enjoy more my flats. And, and in a modern and current FMC, you will have the path of the route on, on, on a glass screen. So it's very easy to, to follow the to follow track of where you are, what's your current waypoint, what's the next waypoint, what are the distances between them. But um, in this INS, uh, you only have numbers. So you need um, to support, you need to use uh, other type of navigational aids, external navigational aids to the aircraft itself. So uh, it's very useful to have some PDFs with your flight plan or even to print them and have them in paper next to your computer. And it forces you to make um, an extra effort of navigation awareness to know every, every time where you are, where you're heading to, when you need to update the navigational system. And that increases the workload on, on the aircraft, but at the same time, um, it it, the flights with Concorde are not as boring as a long flight would be with with any other more than a more sophisticated sophisticated navigational system. Had to be three in the flight crew, and that's also one of the special things about Concorde, which was designed um, to be flown with a um, captain, flight officer, and uh, a flight engineer. And the thing is that. The three of them had a high workload in every single phase of the flight. Um, before preparing the flight, during uh, the taxi, takeoff, uh, acceleration, um, during cruise, descent, you, there is so many things to do all the time. And this workload was supposed to be done by three different people, but on Concord, uh, on the um, on the simulation on the simulator on the version by FS Labs, you are on your own, so you have to take responsibility and be in charge of all the tasks tasks that should be done by three different people, and you have to do them all of them on your own. So again, that's a unique characteristic of Concord. Now. Um, 
set and forget. You know that many modern airlines, you um, program the FMC, um, you program all your route, make your fuel fueling plan, uh, plans, you program your seed or your star, and, and that's almost pretty much it. Once um, you retract your landing gear, you may press the autopilot. Um, most of the times you will not... Um, switch off the autopilot until you are at the decision height or very close to the runway. But in Concorde, you have to be making changes all the time, and very especially the fuel panel. In fact, um, even though I've flown hundreds of hours with Concorde and and I spent a lot of time flying Concorde, um, this is still one of the panels I'm I'm still don't feel very comfortable using them. I've, I've made a couple of tries, but never taken it very seriously. But if you do, uh, you have to be transferring fuel all the time to keep the center of balance um, in the in the safe margins in the safe areas. So you have to be all the time watching every tank and and making because you need to transfer fuel from one tank to the others to keep the center of, gra of gravity. Um, I said that before, and so it's a very busy very busy cockpit. And once again. Uh, makes it very different from a boring transatlantic flight when there's nothing to see but water. Here there's always something to do. One of the examples uh, where the automation is not in Concord and you still have to use tables and manually calculate is the descent. And especially in Concord because take into account that before descending Concord had to decelerate first. So you're traveling at, at a supersonic speed of Mach 2.0 and then first, you need to reduce your speed. And then once your, your, your speed is reduced and you start the descent, then when you reach Mach 1.5, because some characteristic of the engines, you make a second reduction in the power. Then you continue descent. Then at Mach 1.0, then you make another uh, reduce in the, in the throttle position. And, and you need to calculate all these things. And, and you have to take into account, of course, the temperature, the external temperature, the winds. And maybe complicated or maybe fun, depending on, on the way you see it. Uh, if you have a modern glass co cockpit, um, then you will see a very clearly a point that says top of descent, and then you know that that very point is the 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 best or or, or the ideal descent point that where, where your where the aircraft could be the the most fuel um, fuel efficient. Uh, of course, always that you don't fly online. If you fly online, then you have to follow the instructions. Well. In Concorde, this is something you have to calculate by hand yourself. There are some software calculators that make makes this task easier, but I feel also very comfortable using these tables included in the, in the documentation of, of the Concorde by FlySim Labs. Another thing that make my, makes my, my flight with Concorde very different from other detailed aircraft are checklists. I have to admit, admit uh, I'm not um, a very serious person regarding checklists. When I fly other detailed aircrafts, um, I usually make them by memory. I just remem remember the steps. They are very logical. They are not very many steps. So even though if I know that I should be doing the, the che checklist and follow, um, follow, following them one by one, uh, in the end, sometimes I just feel lazy. I just skip them and, and go to the what's important or, or more fun for me. This is not the case in Concord. One, once again, it's something very different. Um, I, I, I really believe that I've never ever been able to, to complete a takeoff, uh, a full departure, without going through all the check, checklists. Because if I do, it's almost guaranteed I will miss and skip an important step. There are so many things to check. There are so many steps to take in any Concord procedure that using checklist is vital. And that is something that just makes me feel better because I've, um, I've over the time, I've checked, I've, I felt that following checklist is a wonderful way to make sure your flight is going to be perfect. Um, again, uh, in other aircrafts, I've never felt that sensation. I felt that, okay, I know I should be following the checklist, but 
come on, I know them by memory, I know them by, by heart, I, I know perfectly which sequence I have to, to follow. But uh, not, not, that is not the case of, of the checklist. Even if you know um, why you have to take it each step, even if you know the logical sequence, in the end, at least myself, I always find forgetting something. So use of the checklist is a must in Concord. Now, another thing that makes Concord different is on the one hand uh, the limitation of nine waypoints. So usually it's very difficult to program the, the, the INS navigation system to follow a full uh, standard departure, uh, instrumental departure or a standard arrival because usually these uh, departures and arrivals include many, many, many points and it's difficult to program them, especially uh, you could maybe you could do it in departure, but especially in the arrivals. Um, so in the end, you have to make uh, and also sorry the um, the second limitation of Concord. I, I talked about it before that the inertial navigational system, uh, the current the current air aircraft also have INS systems, but um, they are calibrated with lasers and and they can get a very high level of precision. Um, but the, the very first unit, not only in Concorde, but in other, in other airplanes using the, that the kind of Ziva navigation system, the problem is that um, the turbulences and, and the movement in the aircraft causes a, a loss in, in precision over, over the time. So um, you will find that many standard departures and arrivals, Concorde could not follow them with the required precision. So most of the times so, or, or the expected way of making a, a departing arrival for Concord is using just classical radio uh, radio aids and departures and arrivals and one again it's something special or different from many aircraft where where you just uh, insert all the intersection and fixed points and follow perfectly your your standard departure then the um, the the traffic controller will give you okay you have to arrive using blah 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 the uh, arrival and then you look for that in your FMC you only have to make one click and then suddenly you've got all your um, flight man management computer populated with all the necessary fixes and intersections and that's it on Concord you need to use um, the the navigational charts with a lot of interest, detail and precision to be able to, to fly them. And also, um, you have to be very careful with the descents because um, the delta wing of Concorde may descend somehow special or different from other aircraft. So keeping your speed and rate of descent on Concorde um, is more tricky than, than in other airplanes. So complying with the different um, altitude limitations and making sure that your lateral navigation is accurate as per the seat and stars and also again complying with the altitudes and, and speed limitations is more complicated on Concorde but once again at the same time this complication for me at least means fun so I feel uh, more satisfied when I complete a successful flight with Concorde than with any other aircraft. Everyone knows that Concorde flew Paris and London to New York um, and vice versa. <clears throat> Some may even know about the Barbados uh, flight from British Airways. But at least in my case, I, I actually at first didn't know if, if Concorde could fly other airports. Uh, that was something I just didn't know. So I did some investigation work. I tried to find out how many different airports where in the world Concorde had flown during her life. And it really struck me um, all the different amounts and different airports located all over the world, uh, even from, from the North Pole to the South Pole, uh, desert, high altitude airport, uh, for example, in Mexico, or in Kenya, uh, uh, um, anywhere in the world. So I decided to make a, a, a world tour. I could visit all these places related to Concord's history and investigate a little bit more what happened in those places. Um, some of these, oops, sorry. Uh, 
And I found that some of these places, um, there were some scheduled flights, for example, Washington, even Mexico, um, Mexico City had for some time, for a limited period of time, some scheduled flights. Uh, other were just charter flights and many others of these flights were just promotional flights. For example, in Tokyo, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, only it was Concord only flew to Tokyo twice or, or three times maximum and, and then another two other times. So in some places, Concord, uh, the visits were very rare. On the other hand, on some of the airports, Concord flew quite regularly. So uh, if you... One of, of of your drawbacks of flying Concord is, okay, but I will always have to fly the same route, Paris, New York, New York, Paris, Paris, London, London, uh, London, New York, New York, London. Uh, no, you, you've got a very wide range of airports where you can fly. And, and I will talk to you about two, two world tools that I prepared and some tools that you will need to be able to fly in and out of any almost any airport that you can imagine uh, i've landed in airports with with runways as short as 6500 feet so as i said you can fly concord almost anywhere uh, another special thing about concord is that if we take into account um the the real weight of the aircraft it should be cataloged as a medium aircraft but uh, actually concord was treated as a heavy aircraft uh, being two reasons for that. One is the Delta Wing. Uh, because of the Delta Wing, um, um, Concorde needed um, a high speed flow of air in order to create lift. So Concorde had to take off and land much faster than, than any medium aircraft and even faster than some heavy air, airliners. At the same time, the Delta Wing created the um, the turbulence created by the delta wing also may force forced uh, the the controllers uh, and the delta and the uh, sorry and the turbulence of the of the engines and wings also uh, made uh, the air traffic controllers to treat uh, concord as heavy uh, and not only during the takeoff also during climbing uh, it was difficult for Concorde to to keep the some speed restrictions so uh, for instance very often Concorde was freed of the 250 speed limitation 250 knot speed limitation below 10,000 feet um, very use, uh, usually above 5,000 feet Concorde could um, continue the acceleration to be always at the at the maximum operating speed and, and that way then uh, it could increase the, the or, or improve the, the fuel consumption. I'm talking about the co fuel consumption and talking about the higher speeds. One of the key aspects of Concorde were the reheat, also known as afterburn. And yes, I'm repeating a lot the word unique, but the truth is that no other civil aircraft, well, um, the Tupolev F allowing, um, used reheat used after burners to to fly and and concord is so special that not even military aircraft can switch off can turn off the reheat after flying at supersonic speed concord one of the keys of the success of concord was that after mach 1.7 um the afterburners the reheat could be turned off and from Mach 1.7 to Mach 2.0, Concord used only the full power of the engines, but with no reheat, which increased the uh, the consumption. I, I, I couldn't say now the figures, but the consumption um, really goes higher with, with the reheat on. Also, reheats were special because they were very noisy. And, and so uh, during the departures procedures, during the departure procedures, Concord had to perform very special and careful uh, procedures, maneuvers, in order to keep the noise abatement uh, within the limits. Um, especially during the first flights, when you are flying Concord the, the first times, it's um, overwhelming. It really saturates you. It's, it's There are so many things to do that you need to pause the simulator and, and do things little by little. And uh, one of the of the things that one of the um, of the causes of that overload is having to deal with the nose abatement procedure. So once again, that's another difference from the Concorde with other aircraft. Here is just 
the control where you would select if you are taking off or flying over, if you are just using the normal engine control schedule or if you are during approaches. More differences, of course, the speed, we've already talked about that, no other speed, no other uh, civil aircraft can fly or could fly uh, at this speed. But Mach 2.0 or Mach 2 was achieved at altitudes above 5, 000, sorry, 50,000 feet. Concorde flew supersonically between 50,000 feet and 60,000 feet and there was no other aircraft flying at that altitude. Um, being alone in sky was a privilege. So as you know with any other heavy aircraft which flies uh, for hours and hours on uh, during oceanic uh, flights, uh, as you go along the route, as, as time goes by, you burn fuel, the, the aircraft gets lighter and you can request a higher fly level, flight level. Uh, after a couple of hours, your, your plane has consumed more fuel, is again lighter and you can request a higher flight level. And, and that's called a step climb. But Concorde didn't have to do that because there was no other aircraft. So once, once the Concorde was above 40,000 feet, um, you could consider the Concorde was alone in skies. So it would climb slowly as it would lose weight. Sometimes you can see that Concorde is just climbing at maybe tenths of, of feet per minute. Um, depending on the temperature and wind, sometimes in order to keep the, the speed of Mike 0.2, uh, Concorde would even decrease, would even go down a little, sometimes maybe some a couple of hundred feet, um, even during the cruise phase would descend a little bit just to keep Mach 0.2. And that is something, once again, completely different from any other aircraft. It was a privilege. And, and if you if you just stop for a moment and, and think about all the things that I've just said about Concorde, uh, maybe just one of these things is not enough in order to consider seriously, seriously flying Concorde. But when you think of the all the differences, all the details, so many things to consider, then that's why I feel so passionate about Concorde. Uh, because Concorde was alone and because the winds, uh, the altitude of 50 to 60,000 feet are not almost, uh, aren't almost affected by the jet streams that crosses the Atlantic and forces any other aircraft and any other airlines to change the Atlantic route at the Atlantic route every day. Uh, you will probably know that there are some routes called NATS, North Atlantic tracks, uh, that change every day depending on the weather. Now, uh, between 50,000 and 60,000 feet, the weather is not so important. So uh, Concorde had the luxury uh, and could keep or maintain the same routes uh, all year round. So Concorde could fly, as I said, all the year, the same route, didn't have to change anything. There was one route for go for the routes uh, for the westbound. There was another for the eastbound. Um, there was another in case two Concords were flying at the same time. Uh, by the way, just notice there's um, a mistake here because the, the route would be Sierra Mike, Sierra November, and Sierra Oscar. So here should be Oscar and not Sierra because all of them were had Sierra at the beginning. There was one more which is not in the in the image, which was Sierra Papa. That that's the was the, the route used for, for Barbados. So once again, one little difference. Uh, Something which is not maybe directly related with Concord and is maybe for some of you, maybe a very tiny detail, something not really important to consider, but uh, it's something I really like. And because Concord could fly uh, faster than the Earth's rotation, that meant that after one sunset, uh, you could fly faster than the Earth and you can see the sun rise again. And it's, also, it's very special because actually if, if in one westbound flight, you can see the sunset twice. If, if you are departing more or less at the, time of, at the time of the sunset, you will see the sunset. And while you take off and, and accelerate and, and reach uh, Mach 0.1, and during all that time, 
the sun will go down and disappear. Then after the transon transonic acceleration and when you are reaching Mach 2.0, then time stops and goes backwards. And you will see the sun coming up again, coming up again, and you will see a sunrise from the west. Now, when you're reaching your destination, then you have to slow down the, the aircraft again. So because you slow down the sun, once again, go down. So you can see two sunsets in just one flight. I mean, uh, you can consider this is silly or stupid or not important, but it's just one more thing that makes you feel that, uh, that you are in a really special aircraft. Flying Concord is also will make you uh, in a very restricted list. Uh, here we've got the, the pilots qualified to fly to operate Concorde uh, through Concorde's history from 1976 to uh, 2003. If you count all the captains and flight officers, we can see that there were just 125 of them for British Airways. Uh, even if we count the flight engineers, the f final figure is below 200. And we can expect similar figures from, from Air France. Well, the thing is that not many people fly Concorde, and exactly the same happens in, in the flight simulation world. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm making this video. Um, many people, almost every one of us, have flown the 737, uh, the 747, the Airbus uh, A320. Who, who doesn't, hasn't ever fly one of these aircrafts? Almost everyone. But if you go through your fly simulation colleagues, if you are within a, a virtual airline, and if you uh, chat with other people interested in fly simulation, you will discover that not many people have actually flown Concorde and even fewer people have flown a simulation as realistic as the, the Fly Sim Labs one. And that's where we get to the point of why I recommend flying um, the Concorde X by Fly Sim Labs. First of all, even though I don't get paid for it, what more? Um, it's absolutely important for me to to let very clear to transmit you to you that I have no commercial relationship whatsoever with FlySim Fly Sim Labs. Uh, I'm making this video because I feel passionate both about Concord on the one hand, um, because I really like the product that FlySim Labs have finally made on the other hand. But um, I'm not really interested in you spending your money in this company or any other. I'm just recommending something that I like in the same way that you would recommend a restaurant that you like or that you would recommend a uh, a place you visited or that you would recommend a car of one brand over the other. Uh, it's true that I've been working, not not working is not the right word. I've been cooperating with FlySim Labs in the 1.3 version beta testing. I, I was trying the, the beta for several weeks um, and I gave them my impressions. I made test flights. I tried to notice anything weird with the beta and cooperate in flights in lamsters but um, because i knew i was going to make this kind of videos this one and, and another tutorial uh, i wanted to make sure that no one could associate me with any commercial um, purchase or any comedia purpose uh, behind this presentation so in the end i decided i personally decided to quit I said uh, I told the FlySim Labs team that I didn't want to be part of the beta team when the when the version 1.3 was released. That I wanted to have complete independence from from the developers and and the beta team. Uh, so as one again once again I'm 100% free to make this presentation. Um, I've paid for the license of the aircraft myself. So uh, I recommend because I like it, but not because I have. Uh, sorry, any commercial intention with it. So, why I recommend it? First of all, the realism. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have access to some of the of the real documentation used by the British Airways crew, um, the 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 Concorde manual, original manual, and it's 
amazing when you compare the the real thing, the real documentation, with the um, the, the documentation provided by FlySim Labs. When you compare the real aircraft, the systems, the detail, the realism, of how everything is modeled. Um, it's amazing to compare it with with the simulation by 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 FlySim Labs. So you you actually have the 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 feeling that you are flying by the book that you could use either the fly sim last documentation or the real aircraft documentation and um, you wouldn't find many differences there are some of them some systems are not simulated but actually uh, you can count them with the fingers on your hand and and all the systems left behind are really irrelevant for having a, a realistic and successful flight so realism and there is no other concord model uh, that comes anywhere closer to the FlySim Labs uh, aircraft, to the FlySim Labs um, product. Now, the recent version 1.3, finally, at last, is compatible with all the versions from prepared, uh, well, all versions. In the moment of making this video, uh, all versions 2.0 onwards and uh, 3.0. Uh, the very last at the moment of this video is 3.1. And also with the with the flight sim um, with the classical um, flight simulator from Microsoft now in the Steam edition in the SE, so you can fly Concord X in any platform, whichever is your preference. Of course, the traditional um, flight simulator by Microsoft. If you install the the DDX10 fixer by Steve, uh, you could also enjoy the DDX10 in the in the traditional. But I, because um many other things i would really recommend you to consider using a better platform such as the the steam edition or for me at least even better the prepared now uh in some of the previous slides uh, i would just trying to describe you the very high workload that the the happens within the the concord cockpit the con con uh, cabin all the, the captain, the flight officer, and the flight engineer have to do a lot of things during all phases of flight. In real life, you as a pilot in command uh, would concentrate and keep your eyes on flying the Concorde. And you would have a flight engineer in charge of many different panels, including the fuel one I described before. You have it in Concord X by FlySim Labs. You've got a virtual flight engineer that will take care of all these changes in the fuel in the engine ratings and uh, many other many other things that will make your flights easier and, and will allow will allow you not to be oversaturated with too many tasks to to do and you can actually activate and disactivate it in flight so if you feel free or you feel that you've got some time to spare, uh, or you've gone to learn little by little, you can disable temporarily the virtual flight engineer and perform some of the tasks yourself. Uh, I, I, I've already talked about this. Uh, the documentation is as close as the real thing as you will ever get. So if you just keep and stay with the FlySim last documentation, um, you can be confident that you will know much many more things that you actually need just to fly the aircraft you can really uh, understand every system you can get within a lot of detailed information which may be not useful for flying the, the aircraft itself but will help you to understand why this aircraft and I will allow myself to say it once again is so unique and one last reason why I would recommend the FlySim Labs version uh, above any other is the support forum there is a custom support of course of course and you can con contact them directly uh, especially if there is any license issues or any problems which are particular to yourself and 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 your problem wouldn't help any customers any other customers in any way but i've always defend the forums as the best way of communication between um, enth enthusiasts or people that share one particular interest or passion and I make no exception with the um, FlySim Labs. The forum is pretty active even if the Concorde uh, is not the most popular of aircraft even if there are not hundreds of thousands of people going every day, every day like in other simulation forums but customers usually are very 
faithful and regular. So you will find um, many people that would you see them time and time again. Uh, in the end, you can create some kind of community sense, community feeling. Um, you will get to know many, many of us, which cooperate there and, and it feels really like a family. So you will get not only support from the FlySim Labs team, which do read and do answer uh, any any questions that you may post in the forums, but very likely you will also uh, get the help and the point of view of many other Concord users. So not only you will get help from the developer, from, from the company itself, but also from other everyday Concord users that will share their experience and on all the, the know-how and knowledge about Concord. Also, one of the one of these users is PXSN, which developed a tool which I will talk about it in, in a moment, which is called Concord Performance System. And that is the tool that will make very easy to make all the necessary calculations about fuel, reference speeds, uh, center of gravity management, and everything you need to know to plan a flight to any airport in the world. Pierre is um, a, um, um, a usual, an active, a very active member of the forum. Uh, it it's gets in almost every day and there is a, a locked topic uh, for dealing with Conco Prefer system develop, uh, development and problems. So if you need any help with this tool, um, the FlySim Labs forum is the, the way to go. I, I think those all these are very solid reasons uh, of why I recommend this. And, and once again, I, I do it by heart because I do feel um, the, all this is true, and uh, not because I'm trying to convince you to to pay for for this aircraft, and, and and no, there's no commercial no no commercial intention whatsoever. I'm just recommending something I feel by heart that is worth your money. Which are the requirements if you want to fully enjoy the the Concord X by FlySim Labs? Well, of course, the platform, um, it used to be only up to version 1.2. It used to be only available for Microsoft Flight Simulation X. But thankfully, uh, after this version 1.3 released in, in late January 2016, it's available to prepare and also the Flight Simulation Steam Edition. So whichever platform you fly, whichever your preference is, you can fly and enjoy the Concord X. Regarding hardware, Concord is not much different from any other complex aircraft, but nonetheless, I will just make a quick comment on, on the requirements. Remember that FlySim, the Microsoft Fly Simulation version uh, is very highly dependent on the CPU, so you need a very quick CPU in order to enjoy, to fully enjoy uh, a nice performance uh, in this particular platform. Uh, overclocking, having an overclock uh, processor is highly recommended in this case. This is not the case, however, for the, the, the newer platform prepared. Concord X behaves very, very well in, in prepared uh, version 2. I tried it myself, but it behaves even better in, in the version, in the new uh, prepared version 3. So you, if you have a, 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 a higher class or, or top of the, of the line GPU, um, it doesn't make much sense for fly simulation, the classical fly simulator, uh, because fly simulator doesn't make a very good use of the GPUs. Instead, overloads the CPU. But if you if you've got prepared, uh, maybe instead of investing in an overclocked pros processor and, and a very very fast CPU. Maybe you are more interested in investing in a nice GPU. Uh, in my computer, I've got a 3.5 gigahertz processor with six uh, cores, and I've had a most a more than pleasant experience with frame rates very close to 30 frames per second most of the times, even if detail airport such as the Aerosoft uh, Heathrow or the the Flight Sim Dream Team, uh, the Kennedy New York Kennedy Airport. Uh, I always recommend at least well, I, 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 eight gigabytes for me is the reasonable amount if you only want your computer for flight simulation. If you're doing any other task, such as maybe video editing, of course, you should increase this amount. But if your main interest is flying simulation, I think eight gigabytes is fair enough. 
If you've got less than this, you may have some uh, problems, out of memory problems, which I will discuss later. This problem is not uh, by it's not a problem of Concorde or any other uh, simulator aircraft, but the platform themselves, because flight simulation, flight simulator, and um, prepared are 32-bit applications then they can only handle a maximum of four gigabytes but of course your operating system also need uh, another amount of ram external applications maybe your weather engine will will also make use of of ram so in the end if you've got less than eight gigabytes uh, you will very likely um, not be able to uh, to make full use of the four gigabytes available for your simulator and um, finally uh, at least at the moment of this video uh, neither Prepare nor uh, Fly Simulator X make a very good use of combined graphic cards. So it's not an investment I would recommend. Um, I, I, I really think that one good card, one, one, one fast card, is uh, will provide you with a better performance than uh, having more than one working in parallel, especially in the case of AMD's, uh, AMD's Crossfire, because the Crossfire... Um, cannot be used if not flying in full screen so you can only make use of this is a driver limitation it has nothing to do with fly simulator but any other game or 3d application crossfire simply won't work in windowed mode at least at uh, the moment of this video in in late january 2016 uh, nvidia on the other hand can use more than one graphic card um, in windowed mode uh, I'm not so keen on this topic in particular, but as far as the last things that I read a couple of months ago was that this was not also a very recommended solution for flight simulation. Maybe this has changed in the last couple of months, but as I, as I say, as far as I know, um, it's more better. It's sorry, it's far better to invest in one good graphic card than in in, in more than one combined. Now, uh, it's very clear. A must read. Um, FlySim Labs documentation about Concord is um, excellent, but the tutorial is a, not only is a must read, but but really a, a, an invaluable piece in order to learn Concord. If you want to fly Concord, you need to read it. it no matter uh, what your knowledge is about other uh, complex aircraft, it doesn't matter if you've flown very good uh, 747 simulations or if you've flown triple sevens or any other complex aircraft it doesn't matter forget about it concord is different and the only way you will be able even to take off will be to follow the tutorial step by step there is no other way to learn it so forget about everything you know set your mind clear in blank read um calmly relax don't hurry there are many things to learn many steps to take and you will need your time. Eventually, it will be one more aircraft you've learned, but it will take your time. And this tutorial is an invaluable tool, so please use it. You will need it. Now, um, because the tutorial uh, made by Flessim Less is so good, uh, together with this presentation, I thought of doing uh, a tutorial and showing you how to fly the Concorde step by step. But because the tutorial made by Flysim Lab is so good, I finally decided to follow the tutorial so you will have a complementary help. On the one hand, you're going to have the, the tutorial which you can follow. For example, I use I still use the tutorial myself even after hundreds of flights to follow all the checklists. Well, you can still keep the PDF and use the PDF in every single flight, but I hope that my tutorial will help you to understand a little bit better each of the procedures explained in the tutorial. Uh, the tutorial is excellent, I repeat. Uh, they are very well explained with a lot of information. I just want to make things maybe simpler or clearer by seeing it in a video and seeing how the, the, the actual things are done and, and what you can expect. Uh, compare your results with, with what I get and, and that's only my only intention. So if you click here in this giant YouTube icon, uh, it will give you, uh, take you, sorry, to another video uh, that will make, you can use as a tutorial um, complement. 
I told you before about PX Session and the tool Concord Performance System. Um, um, I ex already explained about it, but it allows you to create uh, any Concord route anywhere in the world. It will give you, it will create all the necessary uh, route cards. Um, remember that Concord could only be programmed with nine waypoints. So routes had to be divided in in cards with a maximum of nine waypoints. This tool will create all necessary cards and will tell you when to load them and all the information required about them. It will also take into account the real weather. It will calculate the, um, the center of gravity according to the payload. It will uh, calculate all the fuel requirements taking into account if your flight is 100% supersonic, if it includes any supersonic legs, or if it mixes supersonic and subsonic flights. It's an excellent tool. Uh, I really believe has mm, it's, 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 uh, it's payway quality. Even, even if Pierre decided to make this tool for free and distribute it for free and uh, with no cost at all, he could really very well charge for it because it's, it's as good as any other planning tool, any payway pay, pay, uh, planning tool you may have tried. And the only thing that he asks for is to donate. I really believe that uh, Pierre deserves uh, one donation, even if small. Please take into account that you may think that one euro, two euros, three euros is a small amount, but if you add up uh, two, three, one euro per hundreds of users, in the end, that makes a difference. Um, Pierre is working for free. Uh, he expects nothing, but it's a, just a simple way of saying thank you, even if you spend a small amount. Um, you've made a, a, a very big purchase with Concordex by Flysim Labs, or, or maybe you will make it. So just take into an account a couple of more euros or dollars or whatever your currency is makes no not big difference and and it, it, it not makes difference for, big difference for you, but certainly for for Pierre. I talked before about uh, routes you can make with Concord. I created two of them. The first one being the admirable time machine called Concord, which takes you through important airports in the life of Concord. And I will give you some details about those landings, uh, about the Concord development. Um, you've got some information about it. But also, when I finished that tour, I wanted to keep on flying Concorde in different places. One of the main limitations of Concorde is that it could not fly supersonic over land with very, very few exceptions. For example, Concorde crossed uh, three times, if I've not grown, India before the, the Indian government banned Concorde for flying supersonic over, over uh, India's territory. Concorde also had a special permission to fly supersonic over the, the north of Canada. But in general, uh, Concorde would only fly supersonic over water. And then I thought, why not make a world tool jumping from one island to another? Because islands are separated by water, I could always fly supersonic. And that's exactly what I did. And this is the result, the map that you see, where there is um, a world tour with 64 legs that will tell you, as you can see, all around the world, jumping from one, isle one island to another island. I even tried to choose the islands as small as possible and sometimes you've got very long runways other times they are not so long and you will have to plan carefully to to know overweight this other tour i decided to call it land ho and you can find it, the the tour here you've got the the link to my website where you will find these two uh, world tours now, finally, uh, some considerations if you want to fully enjoy uh, Concord experience travel free. The main problem with Concord was, and I remark was, the use of virtual memory addresses. I talked to you before about the four gigabytes limitation and the, the memory management by the original Flight Simulator X was pretty deficient. So it would use much more memory than was actually necessary. So these messages were very common, especially when using some settings that I will detail next. Uh, the new version 1.3 uh, has achieved an impressive reduction 
in the in the memory use or in the memory usage um, and now you will very likely have a, a trouble free experience regarding the memory issues in fact i've been in, during my test in the in the beta 1.3 development um, even using complex add-ons complex sceneries mixing them up trying to to put the memory to test uh, i never had less than a um, 900 uh, megabytes of free memory uh, available so uh, you only will face problems if you well as i was saying the the memory is highly optimized the level of detail is one of the reasons why your memory use usage will increase so keep it at reasonable levels uh, uh, for reasonable level i may consider uh, a setting of 5.5 maybe up to 6 but higher than 6 is very likely you are going to have memory problems also the scenery's complexity you know that in every simulator there's a slider where you can choose the complexity and well, it's quite logical. The more complex a scenery is, the more objects has to load, the more polygons has to load, the more textures has to, uh, the simulator has to apply, and therefore uh, it will make a higher and more intense use of memory. Um, another of these settings, uh, very heavy on memory, is the autogen. Uh, so the higher your autogen is, the more likely your out of memory error is going to be um, this was for me um, in fly simulator uh, in microsoft fly simulator in the original version this was for me the key setting uh, if i have autogen to the max then out of memory errors were almost warranty keeping it at normal or even lower settings um, made my experience problem free also uh, if possible don't load any unnecessary airport or scenery uh, because I only like to keep the departure and destination sceneries and unload any other. Um, and uh, one tool which is very useful for doing that is the Scenery Config Editor. It's another uh, open source free tool that you can, if you click here, you can download and and make it, makes it very easy to group different kind of sceneries. Uh, for example, I like to group them by countries so I can always find which airport I need and activate only those, as I said, that uh, I will be departing and arriving uh, to, and, and that way I make um, a more sensible use of my memory. Finally, be careful with uh, photorealistic textures. They some look great, especially if you like them, but um, in the flying simulator wor world, uh, there are used only a limited set of textures and the simulator repeats them over and over and over and over again. So it makes it load one piece of texture and you will see it repeated in more than one place. Um, but obviously photorealistic textures, because they are different and all of them are different and every single pixel and every single square and tide are different one from another, uh, as, as expected, uh, the, the use in, in, in virtual memory addresses, in the use in memory, is higher than with the regular um, textures applied by default. So if you are flying Concorde in heavy sceneries and you've got out of memory problem, please check you are not using any photorealistic. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for watching. I realize now that this presentation is well over an hour long. So I really doubt if many of you uh, will have been patient enough to to stay the, the full of this presentation. But nevertheless, uh, my intention is no other than trying to help you to decide if Concord can be a nice experience for you. I, I really believe so. I recommend it to anyone enthusiastic of the fly simulation. I hope to have been clear, not very boring and i hope you are also interested in in the other videos i mentioned about um, the tutorial for concord and there's i also forget also forgot to mention that i've got another tutorial about concord performance system so if you click here 
uh, it will take you to another tutorial explaining how to use this tool um, so that you know also how you can program a, a tool to anywhere anywhere in the world thank you very much for watching i hope that you see my other videos and we'll keep in touch and see you in the flashing lab forums uh have a nice day goodbye